think there were 64 sales and 29 out of the 64 either sold at asking or above asking. So that right there, that's 30% of the sales were uh, mm -hmm. still a, what would indicate a, uh, uh, a seller's market, right? But as we know, when the market starts to shift downwards, then you start going into a buyer's market, right? And that's the assumption that prices will drop. So we don't actually see any indication of that yet, but you know, with our, you know, combined 30 plus years of experience between all of us, uh, we know that what the indicators are gonna, what, what are the different things that are gonna drive different shifts and changes to the market? Hello everybody. Well, I am here with the Real City Group, and we have gotten a lot of questions about uh, what's happening with the market uh, within COVID. So we'll jump to all of that. But uh, firstly, just on the agenda, we're going to talk about what's happening with COVID, uh, how that has affected the housing market, and of course, realtor responsibilities. You can see that open houses are being done very differently and really not being done at all. It's about the showing. So we're going to talk about how that's all been virtualized. Uh, a lot of people are asking about in the next few months, what should I be looking for if I am a homeowner looking to downsize, upsize, or if I'm currently renting? And then we're going to talk about some anecdotes on what some of the current clients uh, that the real estate group has are kind of experiencing, asking, and doing. And we'll end off with a quick uh, update, of course, on lending. So with that, uh, I'll, I'll start off with the team leader, uh, Bradley Cothlow, to kind of introduce a bit about the real estate group, which I have to vet in a thousand ways. I work very closely with them, and uh, it's an awesome bunch to work with, very communicative, and definitely, I think, raising the bar on you know, how they deal with clients and how they educate people and how they build relationships before uh, sell houses. So with that, uh, guys, welcome to uh, the episode on Level Up Mortgages. Thanks for having us, Paul. Uh, we're excited to be here. Obviously, share our experience with uh, you, uh, the public, and kind of you know, hear how things are happening on your side of things, the mortgage, because I think the two and two go together um, so that we we need to be able to navigate this from both the financial and the, the sales side of things. And I think, you know, what you said there off the top is that it's really relationship focused right now. And that's kind of the attitude that we've taken towards things um, in our business and the way that we choose to operate is it's always been relationship first, sales second. So we're always about building that relationship with our clients, you know, doing our best to provide quality advice using our experience because we are a high volume uh, real estate team. Uh, we finish in the top 10% every year and we're always trying to improve upon that. But uh, what that, the beauty of that is that it affords us is the experience to be on the front lines. We hear probably more stories than most about kind of how, you know, people are, you know, perceiving what's happening and then how they're adapting. So I know I've got a great team uh, here with us. And so Brendan, Tanner, and uh, Bryce are on the call. Uh, Chris was unavailable, but uh, we uh, all are experiencing different things because we all service different areas of the lower mainland. And so we're excited to share that with you and kind of hear how things are going on your end of things. I love it. Well, great introduction. Thanks so much for that. And yeah, let's jump into kind of, you know, we're seeing, and of course the team is mainly BC focused. Uh, and, you know, I think BC's been, been getting the best press so far around planning the curve. Uh, maybe let's talk a bit about an update you guys have seen on Canada's position with COVID uh, and how it's affecting, I mean, specifically, um, I would say, of course, real estate. And even if, you, if there's some grants you've seen that are, you think are really juicy and not a lot of people know about, uh, sort of bring up to a lot of uh, self-employed people that are probably going to be watching as well. So, yeah, what are you guys seeing as far as COVID and, and real estate uh, uh, is concerned so far? Um, well, I think there's two parts to COVID, right? I think obviously you have the infection virus side of things, but you have the economic impact and how the government is trying to help us weather the storm, really, right? We've seen a, a bunch of different programs that they've rolled out to help uh, individuals as well as businesses. But also you've seen the Bank of Canada, which you can talk to and how they're trying to, you know, prevent I would say a market collapse to some degree because they're, they're, you know, moving the interest rates down so that, you know, they're making it more affordable that they can continue to stimulate the marketplace. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, hundred um, percent. 
And I guess, yeah, how does this sort of relate to, um, yeah, the housing market? People are asking a lot of questions about the realtor responsibilities. Are there still showings? Um, you know, how are the expireds working, listings, et cetera? So how, how if I'm, especially on your guys' website, very popular website, how do I approach this research process now? So uh, I'm, I'm just going to just quickly just kind of. Please. Uh, yeah. For, for BC, I would have to say, uh, I think we're kind of handling pretty, pretty well um, in terms of the other, I guess, uh, provinces. And I think most of the housing market in terms of realtor responsibilities and housing uh, market will be dependent on, I guess, you know, how we're flattening the curve and how we're taking care of this uh, whole situation. So as soon as we can, I guess, get back to our um, regular duties and uh, responsibilities, I think that's kind of when we can start to say, okay, uh, show houses again, because at the moment right now, we can't, we can't do these open houses and uh, we're refrained from doing any showings at all, even private showings. And um, I think it just, it, well, I, I don't know, some provinces are saying until May that they're, you know, shutting everything down. I don't know what it's going to be like here, here in BC. I know, uh, I guess, just looking at some of the stats, uh, it's looking like uh, we're doing a little bit better than other provinces, but I don't know, as of now, we're, we're not able to do, um, I guess, 80% of our um, duties and uh, responsibilities as of now. Mm -hmm. and so just, just to I, yeah. I was just going to clarify a little bit on that. So. Um, obviously, open houses have been shut down. Showings are still taking place. I think what you're seeing is is that it's forcing um, buyers out there to really take a more a serious approach. Um, I want to make it sound as nice as possible. Not not to imply that people are just kind of you know house hunters for fun, but I think what this does is that because you know showings have to they have to indicate a, a seriousness towards the property before both the homeowner as well as the listing agent are going to allow them into the property um you know people are having to get their ducks in a row they're having to get like an actual pre-approval a lot of people like to say they're pre-approved oh, as yeah. you know there's a difference between you know like saying that i have like this this amount to be able to debt service this amount but to actually get the letter and commitment from a bank is two different things. And I think, you know, this is forcing people to get everything kind of together sooner and then really kind of address and look at, and I think this is where my team, you know, Brendan Tanner and Bryce are fantastic. They really spend the quality time with people to understand what the difference between the wants and their needs are and trying to match that with the property. You know, they, they spend that extra amount of time. And so the only thing that's different is we always start off with our new buyers, whether it's from the website or anything else with the buyer consultation that's where our guys will sit down and they'll go and kind of truly dig in and understand you know what uh the clients are looking for and then then they go back to the war room and they kind of dig in deep and find the right properties for them so the only thing that's changed now is they're having to do these things virtually they're doing things like we're doing here on this meeting they're doing it via zoom we uh we do use google hangouts because that's a we found it was a great method for uh, communicating with people, but it's just, it's all about streamlining. You've got to kind of, I, th I think, identify and understand those things. And again, I think that's why we've been successful. If you guys, if you know, out there, follow us on Instagram, you can see that we've been quite active. We've got a lot of sales recently. It's because, you know, we're really, you know, digging deep and finding the right properties for our clients. That's allowing them to take action. Mm -hmm. I love it. Can, no, I, can I just touch upon a little bit more, I guess, uh, in yeah, terms of, uh, vir uh, I guess, housing market and going towards virtually, we've seen basically every industry going to virtual means. And we've seen, you know, Amazon's taking most of the market share as of now. Why can't we see the real estate market take the exact same type of steps and go into more technology based? And I think this is kind of, where we should be stepping up and considering these options and um, trying to move towards the, I guess, where most of the other industries are taking it, which is through online, through virtual means, yeah, I'm doing virtual showings or whatever, whatnot. I even heard about people doing a, uh, uh, doing a Zoom meeting for uh, a listing, for listing, uh, uh, I guess, uh, yeah, for appointments. 
So, I mean, I think we've been, uh, especially the Real City Group, I think we've been already on top of that in terms of marketing ourselves online. And we do a great job in terms of social media. And I think that's just the first step into, yeah. uh, I guess, kind of expanding on this housing market and seeing what we can do with technology to, I guess, further kind of outreach our duties and responsibilities as a realtor. Yeah, no, hundred percent. I think guys do a great job with it. And then, like, let's let's let, let's put up, pull up the crystal ball and look out a few months, right? You said, Brendan, a moment ago that you know it looks like until May things are pretty shut down. So again, if I'm a, if I'm a, a home buyer or someone who yeah who wants to look for a property and I'm currently you know on hold waiting things out, can I wait things out and still be proactive? Like, what do you recommend for people to do during their search? And I mean. The biggest question is, should people wait? Uh, how long should they wait? Uh, where do you see the housing market going? This is the big question, right? But yeah, wh where is the housing market going in a few months? Just from what you see, and, and we'll have to, of course, see what happens. But what, what have you guys seen from being uh, having, the, having the boots on the ground and obviously talking to lots of different people? Um, so I wish it was a one-size-fits-all, right? And I think, again, that's where we've separated ourselves. Um, these are definitely case by case and it's not, you can't say, okay, well, this is what everybody should do because everybody's got individual needs. Um, some of the things that impact those things are, is one is like, do you have something listed, right? Because that obviously affects you. Like, do you have something to sell? Are you, have you sold it? Uh, and then obviously you've got some different economical things that are happening is a lot of people are laid off. Right. So as far as like, cause there's two, there's two separate kind of questions in this one question, in my opinion. Um, so as a whole, I'm never a believer in necessarily wait and see, I think, cause you know, there's a motto that we always use in, you know, throughout our kind of careers here is that you don't know you've hit bottom until you know the market's already on its way back up and so i think there's a general assumption that the market will uh, collapse so i actually looked at uh the last 14 days in my market area because i was just curious to see what other people are doing and uh out of the i think there were 64 sales and 29 out of the 64 either sold at asking or above asking so that right there that's 30 percent of the sales were uh, mm -hmm. still a, what would indicate a, uh, uh, a seller's market, right? But as we know, when the market starts to shift downwards, then you start going into a buyer's market, right? And that's the assumption that prices will drop. So we don't actually see any indication of that yet. But, you know, with our, you know, combined 30 plus years of experience between all of us, uh, we know that what the indicators are going to, what, what are the d different things that are going to drive different shifts and changes to the market. And so um, you can obviously speculate, but unemployment and the inability to debt service from your side of things, Paul, you, you can speak to is that you, if you can't pay the mortgage, you can't have the mortgage. Right. And so we have to assume that there is going to be a trickle down effect. So as far as, you know, the advice that we're giving to people, it is a case by case situation. We're in a little bit of a difficult situation. I have probably a backlog of about uh, 10 properties that uh, I would love to list right now, but they're tenanted properties because they're in, uh, investors that own them. And as you know, with the new rules right now is that you can't pro uh, provide vacant possession. So what that means for people out there that are listening, if you are somebody who's looking to buy a property and move into it, and it is currently tenanted, traditionally you would give a two months notice, they would get like a month of free rent, and then they would vacate at the time of possession for you to move in. As of right now, uh, there's some protections that have been put in place by the government that will not allow uh, the homeowner to evict the tenants. So what that means is, is that they can't uh, obviously take vacant possession and move in. So that affects our ability because that shrinks. So if I were to go and list those properties right now, the market for investors, obviously, because those are the people who are a little bit more savvy. They're looking at different financial and economic trends to decide where the best place to put their money is. Typically, what you see is people will shift the money back and forth between real estate and the stock market. Neither, uh, so the stock market right now is is performing much worse than what the real estate is. But you're trying to figure out where the smart money is going to flow. And so, right now, um, if I were to list one of those properties, uh, the market for it would be dramatically reduced because how many people are actually in the market for an investment property right now? I, I couldn't actually, you know, say. Um, so I, that's a difficult thing that I'm definitely facing out there. 
Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. I think those are, it depends on who it is. Bryce, did you want to add to that? Yeah, what I'm uh, noticing as well is um, obviously we're spending a lot more time on the phone with clients now trying to keep the uh, relationships going, uh, making sure people's uh, concerns and questions are answered. Uh, what we're noticing is the, uh, a lot of people are asking is like, okay, well, you know, world events and uh, you know, places maybe aren't going to be selling as much in the future. Um, are we noticing any pricing reductions and, um, you know, where is that heading in the marketplace? Um, obviously, with the bank's uh, six-month deferral program, which uh, most people are able to get uh, some, if not all of that, um, there's not going to really be a lot of incentivization for sellers to reduce the price because uh, if they're not, uh, you know, feeling that pressure from the mortgages, um, right. that probably won't be happening yet. What we'll probably be noticing is, um, you know, in a few months from now, if this has not been um, you know, found a solution for, uh, it'll be interesting to see. Of course, no one has a crystal ball, but, uh, you know, when it comes to, uh, you know, five months out from now, if this is still a problem, we might be noticing uh, some more uh, economic, uh, you know, reductions of uh, pricing at that point more. So about around September. Yeah, give or take, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So to add point. to that. Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, just to add to that, I, I think we've already seen what the buyers are willing to accept in terms of pricing, and we've already seen it go to market value. And um, I think it's just dependent on whether they can, you know, I guess uh, start seeing homes again and uh, having this kind of normalize where we can kind of show buyers in uh, places on a regular basis. And I guess the other thing is just really what's going to happen to them financially, um, whether if that's going to, whether if they've lost their job or they're, you know, getting hours cut or something like that. I think it really depends on that situation. But in terms of the housing market prices, I think it's we've already gone to that point where uh, certain, uh, I guess, prices have already been accepted by the market. Yeah, and Brendan, like we have a case we're working on right now where I think the client said, hey, like the people have been laid off at my at my company. So if I'm at risk, then what do we do about that closing date that's, that's you know, that's been, put, that's been pushed out further into the summer? Because, of course, I mean, it's not quite Bradley's situation. What he mentioned around that you can't evict the tenants. But I think the, the sellers don't want to get out of it yet. They want to extend things over. So we've got, we're already seeing that. And what, we, what I've seen on the mortgage side, a lot of the banks is a lot of banks are saying, hey, yeah, if, if you don't have a job by the time your house closes, generally speaking, we can't fund the mortgage, right? And that's something that's a huge uncertainty for a lot of people. There, however, are banks that have said, and they all have different cutoffs, and it's, it's changing by the day, but they'll say, hey, if you've already, of course, removed subjects, <laughs> which means your deposit's basically gone by this date, and if you get laid off, then we will still honor it. And, and of course, we want to see that it's a temporary layoff. And they've got their different sort of, um, I guess, rules. But the banks are, and lenders in general, are reacting to that in, in different ways. But yeah, that's something you definitely want to find out about as you're shopping around for lenders and looking at the different rates, which of course are attractive. But it comes down to things beyond just the rate, obviously. It's how are they going to be flexible towards uh, those situations. But I guess that's, that's a way to kind of echo what, what you're saying, just like, you know, around people losing their jobs that, you know, lenders are slowly catching up, but it still is obviously an uncertainty. And if you think that, you you know, the high chance you may get laid off, then I would, you probably didn't need to hold off for now, right? Or really find out what the lender policies are. So that's an important uh, point, that I guess you kind of sparked with me. But yeah, awesome point on your end as well. Um, did you and guys did you, I think Tanner had something he wanted to kind of throw Please, in Please, yeah, there. jump in. Yeah, no, it's just that's, that's what I was hearing as well is that the, the lenders are going to, uh, you know, honor some of these things. I think what all they're requiring is some of them is just a, a letter stating the layoff is temporary and that they, there is an intention for this person to be hired back, which is which is a nice thing, right? It's it's, it's going to prevent some pretty ugly situations. So, um, you know, it's just good to see all the industries as a whole just kind of adapting to the things that are going on. Yeah, 100%. Those are great points. And so we're starting to talk about current clients, right? And again, you got, you, we've already talked about some anecdotes, but are there any other anecdotes you want to talk about as far as um, interactions with clients on just their financial situations, um, how people are, are dealing with COVID right now, not just as far as buying real estate, but in general, 
tactics they're taking as far as conserving money. Maybe it's personal finance strategies, it's deferring the, uh, other kinds of payments, or just in general taking precautions that maybe they should have done earlier on as far as just cleaner ways to live. Let's put it that way. So yeah, what are the, what's the general sentiment, but really just around people saving money. And again, we're all planning for the rebound because when this blows over as it will, uh, people want to be in the best possible shape and, and even opportunistically be in and possibly get a property below market value, right? If things go that way. So yeah, any more anecdotes around current clients and coping strategies? I think it really depends on what their personal situation is. Like, are you taking advantage of the emergency response benefit? Are you an essential service worker where your, your financial position hasn't changed? You know, will that change going forward as they maybe narrow down what they consider essential, right? So it's, it's definitely, you know, person by person thing. And, you know, some people maybe aren't feeling it as much being an essential service. It's obviously tough for them, for them to go about their business, but you know, financially, they, that may not impact somebody as much as, you know, somebody that would be a, a, a service industry worker or something like that. Yeah. And like kind of adding to that, I think it's, this all goes back to the way you fundamentally view real estate. Cause I think there's two factions on this. I think there's the one who just view it as the house that they need to live in because people still need a place to live. And the one thing that everyone has to remember, remember is that uh, regardless of price, rental rates have grown quite a bit over the last couple of years and they're up into the amounts that you're now currently paying for a mortgage. So we've seen the mortgage rates drop, money's even cheaper. You, chances are you're still gonna be able to finance your property cheaper than what you're gonna be able to rent it for, right? So like, it's, there's cash flow opportunities for the investor, but going back to my original point that I was making is that it depends on whether or not you're looking at a house or you're commoditizing right? People who commoditize their property and think of it as a stock of up and going up and going down depends on what, if, if these are investments for you, or if this is your primary residence, if it's your primary residence, it's going to go up, it's going to go down, it's going to go up, it's going to go down. But over time, uh, which has been proven, even when we've had uh, some really crazy times back in the 80s to uh, 2008, the, the financial crisis that happened then is that property value still over time always went up. So, you know, as you kind of know on your end of things, Paul, is that you're looking at a five-year mortgage term. So I'll give, I'll share my own personal experience. I bought a place in November. I felt mm -hmm. like I was capturing the end of that down market, which I think I timed it right until obviously COVID hit. But uh, in January and February, we saw it shift back to a seller's market. Prices were up in my area uh, where I purchased. I actually saw 10 to like up to 10% jumps on some of the property's values. So I, I was definitely, pardon me, uh, in Fort Coquitlam. I'm in cool. Riverwood in Fort Coquitlam. Um, and so I saw some big jumps. So I, I really feel like I timed it properly. Um, but the one thing is that even if I didn't time, time it properly, if I do see uh, property values, say, drop 10, 15, 20%, my mortgage just started in November. I'm in for a five-year term. I can almost guarantee that even if it does drop that amount, by the time my five-year term comes up, which nobody typically exits uh, or sells you know, kind of mid-term, people start to think about selling when their term is coming up. Uh, yeah. My property will probably be at or above what I purchased it for by that five-year term, right? People don't like to pay, uh, you know, the three-month interest, or in this case, interest rate differentials, right? Um, people, I'd love for you to speak about that because I think a lot of people don't understand how that stuff works. When you see your interest sure. rates dropping, so that so if interest rates are currently being offered lower than what you got yours at, the bank is going to penalize you because they they cannot get the same rate of return that you're providing so you need to pay that out so uh mm -hmm. people that are that would try to exit they would be in a really bad position when you're seeing the interest rates go in the opposite direction mm -hmm. yeah good point um and that's back to like figuring out with your lenders i mean and actually on the point of breaking a mortgage usually it's close to two-thirds of people and, it's, and yeah selling a house is one reason which isn't super common in this first five years if you do a five-year term but also, I mean, look, unforeseen events, uh, a lot of people need to consolidate cash right now. If you refinance, yes, you can actually capitalize on a lower rate, but that technically breaks your mortgage in most of the cases, right? And in some cases, if you, if you do the math, you might be like, oh, wow, it's still worth it for me long term to break it now. And hopefully, if I'm, if, again, the big banks will do IRD, right? So interest rate differential, which can be anywhere from, honestly, 2 to Two to twenty, two to fifteen percent of the mortgage. We've seen like people get smacked with fifty thousand uh, dollar penalty breakage uh, fees with the bigger banks. So it's important to be like, okay, 
there's two thirds of people that break their mortgage. There's divorces. There's so many things, right? So as those happen, if, if that happens, how much am I willing to give up if, if there if there's a, an interest uh, charge, right, or the penalty charge? Uh, so yeah, that's super important to figure out with the lender, understand anything can happen. And again, sometimes breaking your mortgage isn't such a bad thing if you do the math and if you do it deliberately. I think refinances are the most common thing that people are doing. But yeah, those are all like really good points around like just doing your, your due diligence and um, you know figuring out where things are at and you know uh, what that means as and, far as being a homeowner versus a renter. And I think that's why we feel like we have such a great relationship with you, Paul, because I think you do a really good job of finding the best mortgage products for the clients and mm-hmm. you help them understand these things, right? And so, yeah, kudos to you for the, the care and uh, the work that you put in for the clients. Yeah, well, mu- well much appreciated. It's a teamwork makes the dream work, right? Um, so yeah, I know it, it's been an awesome collaboration. And maybe to wrap up, I'll give a couple quick updates uh, on the mortgage end, and then we can do a wrap up on, on your guys' team. So so yeah, we've covered a lot. I mean, just as far as rates go, I get a lot of fixed versus variable questions. Uh, variable rates right now are as low as 2.10. Most fixed rates, I'm seeing at like 2.5, right, on, low, on the lower end. So obviously variable is much lower. Why is that? Mainly because the prime lending and the overnight rate, uh, that is usually what variable rates follow. Uh, the bond yields going down are what fixed rates follow, although even though the bond yields are still kind of down, the rates haven't quite followed recently, which means the banks are kind of not passing on the savings as much onto consumers because they want to conserve cash. So, okay, fair enough. Um, if you're look, I mean, the biggest thing now is like, well, fixed rates variable. Variable's actually done the best uh, historically, but of course, there's a bit more volatility with variable and people want to have a consistent rate that they're paying. So I get it. I think, I think uh, 75% of people will do fixed five years, but variable traditionally does actually outperform, and especially in this market, it's outperforming. So just some notes on that. Uh, and just the biggest thing right now is pre-approvals. And this ties back just to real estate. Like there's so many stories of people who they've gotten a loose pre-approval or which is actually okay to get a loose pre-approval, assuming you've, you've, trust who you're giving it to and you have really budgeted properly what your expenses are and then what your actual income is. And of course, assuming you have a good credit score um, and there's more official, you know, pre-approvals you can do, but sometimes like banks don't want to do pre approvals because it's a lot of work for them. So a lot of times they won't even issue them by the way. So just make sure that like you get a, a certainty from whoever you're working with as far as, okay, so you're, what's the certainty that, that I'm pre-approved. And I, I mean, from my experience, even in 90% certainty, that's probably not for you to go shop around at houses, but obviously before you actually put a deposit on a house, you want to be, you want to be approved for that matter. So just some notes on that is pre-approvals litter. I mean, I, I've done a bit of the math. I like math. And uh, I did a, I sang a, a, actually a client an email yesterday or a, or a prospect and they're like, Hey, um, I've been thinking about doing a, a pre-approval. I've got nothing else to do. I'm just sort of sitting at home, but how long does it take and how much can I really save? So I came up with $10,000. <laughs> from 28 minutes of your time. So uh, most people, that's a pretty good uh, ROI on their time. And the way I came up with that is that essentially, if you get a 2.10 rate right now, you can hold up for up to 120 days. So let's say by you know early August, you are things get better, especially in BC, and you have a 2.10 rate, which by the way, by, by, by the time we're over there, that might be a lot higher. You know, you know, Usually when rates are on the higher end, they're closer to 3.10. So a percentage point between 2.10 and 3.10 with let's say a $330,000 mortgage average across a five-year term, that's like a few dollars under 10 grand. So obviously this is a very specific case, but you guys hopefully get the idea that right now getting pre-approved to not just know your budget, but also to hold the rate down for up to four months is just good planning, right? So that's something that I'm pushing a lot of people to get pre-approved and, and you know potentially save $10,000 off 28 minutes. That's how precise I was coming in my, my marketing campaign for people to just, you know, do that as they're watching that sort of friends. But that's kind of really the update uh, on the mortgage side. Just be proactive, plan for the rebound, hold rates down, and just know what you can afford. I guess putting it back over on the real estate side, uh, any closing thoughts from the team as far as how do we as uh, prospective uh, home buyers and investors, how do we plan for the rebound? What are some action steps people can take right now beyond getting a pre-approval? Well, I think it's keeping 
keeping your, your thumb on the pulse. I think it's like, it's important to have really great representation. Obviously this is where we plug real city group, um, you know, where we are on the front lines and we know, and we, we actively track um, what we all try to do with our clients that we're working with is give them kind of weekly updates. We're looking at the stats of what's happening. We're having real conversations with sellers and buyers so that we know, and we can, to the best of our ability, advise them as where we think things are going. Because I think, you know, with what Brendan touched on earlier, there is a market equilibrium. I think we saw it in the last two years. Everyone thought the bottom would fall out of the market, but it, it, it obviously went down, but it only went down a certain amount because at the end of the day, the sellers are only willing to accept a certain price point uh, to sell their home. Um, so I obviously, you know, with the impacts of, you know, losing your job, that could alter things. So we might see a little bit, uh, you know, lower threshold if it goes that route. I think the banks and the government are doing really great things to help stave off that. Um, and I think the important thing is, is that from the buyer standpoint that we're working with, like we have a form that we give out to them before we'll go out and show them properties. And I'll just kind of read off a couple of those things just so they can be prepared. So the things that we're looking for before we'll kind of, you know, go out there and, you know, view a property is we're looking for that bank pre-approval letter. We want to make sure that the client has reviewed the MLS listing in full. They've reviewed the video and virtual tour, uh, the floor plan. Uh, that they've driven by and are familiar with the location. And if it's a strata property, you want to make sure that they understand the strata plan, the bylaws and the rules, right? And so we're looking for, we're, we're leaning heavily back on the buyers themselves to make sure that they're doing their due diligence prior to going out. Um, what I think is great from us on the standpoint is we've already done, we always do really great job for our listings. We always have the best photography, best videography. You know, we always have a floor plan. We're always doing the things that are necessary to put our clients in the best position to sell for the most amount of uh, money in the least amount of time. And so what is great for us is that we already set this bar so high that we're putting pressure on the other agents within the market that they provide the same level of service that we are. So I just think, again, it's like, you know, right now it's about the realtor and performing for their client. Um, I'd like to ask kind of the other guys on the team, just kind of give a closing thought here on uh, kind of from their point of view. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll have a quick uh, interjection there. Um, yeah, I actually recently saw an email that uh, mentioned uh, at the end of the uh, the world wars, you know, the, there was a big celebration of the economic uh, boom that happened after that, uh, with all the people celebrating by, you know, going out and shopping. Um, when this is over, um, hopefully it's over soon. Uh, there's probably going to be a really big market push, and anybody who's had their uh, chance mm -hmm. to take the time when they have the time right now to do what you said, you know, get on the website, surf the properties, get familiar with your area and what type of product you are gonna be wanting. Um, have a conversation with us, you know, get set up and with uh, one of these searches to start showing you uh, what properties are targeted to what uh, the client's gonna want. Uh, you know, get the pre-approval, Paul, what you just said. Uh, get it locked in so that way when, uh, you know, they, they do see something and they are ready to go and, uh, you know, get the property, they're gonna be able to take advantage of that before that uh, big push happens uh, when the market picks up. Uh, and buyers don't want to have to be out there doing competing with multiple offers and, and buying when the market's in the upswing too much. Um, you know, it's it's not much fun being the buyer. Fun to be a seller at that point, but uh, not much fun to be a buyer. Um, you know, when you're doing too much competition. So if buyers can be ready to pull the trigger uh, before that happens, um, there that might really be advantageous for their timing. Yeah, that's a great point. I love it. Very optimistic too. That that's the way we should be looking at things. Yeah, the the rebound. We have one big party. <laughs> Andrew? Yeah, it's, it's a very similar sentiment to Bryce, right? I mean, generally, if there are periods of, of, of somewhat minor or major recession, they're usually followed by periods of growth. But, I mean, everybody's going to be on their own timeline, and it's going to be what, what works for them. And, you know, we're just there to kind of guide them through and, and put the steps in place for whenever that time is right for them. And, the industry as a whole is is adapting to you know people that they're still going to need to buy and sell right now but you know the, the preparation for the future is is going to be a big thing as well love it thanks for sharing that right so um uh, yeah just to sum everything up kind of at that point is yeah i think we've seen uh again what the market is willing to accept and then um it depends on whether if the buyers are able to afford it or not you know, depending on their financial situation as of now. I know it's a little bit tough, but 
we'll have to see. Um, so in a general sense, will, you know, house market, I guess house prices drop? I don't know. It would be tough to say, uh, especially if the fact that is we're seeing inventory so low and we're continually starting to see the inventory drop. And I mean, it's, it's, going to be at a point where if there's a flood of buyers and there's not enough inventory, then yeah, they'll have to go into multiple offers and it's, it's going to continue to, I guess, see that way. So I don't know, in terms of the stock market, it might be a little bit different. Um, I think there's a little bit of a comparison. People are saying, uh, you know, seeing stock market drop, maybe they might see the house market drop too. Um, I, I think they're on different timelines in, in that kind of sense. Um, so. As of right now, um, well, of course, um, like Bryce was saying, I wish I had the crystal ball to um, you know, kind of predict yeah, to, things. To, but yeah, just to add on to kind of what Brendan's saying is like, you, from an investment standpoint, uh, the stock market and the real estate market usually oppose each other. Uh, when the stock market fails, people look for safe harbor, harbor and tangible real estate. Right. So if the market stays, uh, the, the stock market stays suppressed, then people will look to if they've exited their money. It's kind of like depending on what their investment strategies are. A lot of the times you'll see that money flood back into real estate. Totally. So be be interesting to see. But I think I think really what just to sum it all up is I think the most important thing here is for anybody out there that are listening is you need really great representation with people with knowledge and experience to help guide you through. Obviously, Real Estate Group is here to support you from the real estate side, and, and Paul is fantastic on the finance side. And I think both of the both of us and Paul working together, we can get you through this and put you in the best uh, position to succeed. I love it. Well, thanks so much for uh, for that roundup, everyone. Uh, with that, we'll sign off uh, for the listeners. Uh, thank you for tuning in, and as always, uh, level up your living. Uh, Brendan, Brad, Tanner, Bryce, and yes. Even Brielle, who has been tuning in, now, she's a key part of the team. Uh, thank you so much for the insights today and uh, look forward to doing one of these again in the future. Uh, stay healthy and look forward to helping out some people to be homeowners and be awesome investors. Thanks again. Thank Thanks, you. Paul. Thank you, guys. See you, Paul. Take care. Thank you, guys.